you, everybody, sisters and brothers. Uh, Mike King was my best friend. More than that, he was like my little brother. Uh, I brought some family. I brought Nancy, Alex, Ryan, Corey, and my wife, Lourdes. Uh, we're all really tight. Um, Mikey was my little brother's best friend, was my cousin's best friend. I just, I've, known him, I've known him since he was four years old. I've never known anybody longer in my life that wasn't my blood. Um, he was just an awesome guy, you know. Uh, we grew up together in the 90s. Uh, we ran amok. You know, we, we, uh, we were young kids, and we got in a lot of, a lot of trouble together. We had a lot of good times together. Uh, the defining moment in Mikey's life was the, the minute he found out he was going to be a dad. Uh, we all thought he was crazy, but it, it was the happiest day of his life, you know. Uh, he was 18 years old, so we thought he was crazy, or 18, you know. But that's what all he ever wanted to be was a dad. I mean, he was stoked, you know. And he turned right around. He, uh, he went from running the streets and getting in trouble to uh, looking for a way to take care of his family. He went back to West Virginia, uh, learned a trade, learned drywall from his mother, who was an excellent drywaller, uh, taught him everything he knew. He found a trade, and he took pride in his work. It gave him what he needed to be able to take care of his family. And by doing that, he inspired the rest of us. Uh, my son is nine years old. Uh, he's the apple of my eye. The reason I'm a plumber is because Mike was a drywaller. You know, uh, he, he just, he, he would do anything to, to feed his family. One of the things that struck me when they, they, they said that he was an armed robbery suspect, <clears throat> Mikey would bounce across the country to follow work. He would rather go from... L.A. to West Virginia in a car with his family with no support because there was work out there. And then when the work ran out over there, he came back here. Then he went to Vegas. You know, Mike, Mike, he took his trade with him everywhere that he went. So when I found out that he was an armed robbery suspect, I knew that, pardon me, it looks like we are you know, I knew that was bullshit because he would rather work a 16-hour day than steal from anybody. So right off the bat, you know, they're profiling him in a way that was completely disrespectful and, and uh, against his character as a human being. Um, how was he murdered? That's the see, The worst part that, that none of us can get over, that we're struggling with here, you know, uh, he was going out to celebrate his birthday. He was going to turn 32 years old in three days. He's going out with his wife. Uh, if you guys join us at the Moore Memorial tomorrow, you'll see where he was murdered and, and just, you know, uh, how ridiculous the whole situation was. He's going across the street to get a pack of cigarettes for his wife. They were going out to celebrate. And I guess an hour and a half before this situation, there had been an armed robbery in the neighborhood, two supposedly African-American assailants, although the city of Downey has never released any information to the public identifying these gentlemen who they were looking for that night. Um, I guess Mikey fit the description of an African American if you're a totally backwards, ignorant, insulated police officer who doesn't know anything about your community. He fits a perfect description because he was a white male who happened to be into hip hop music and maybe liked to dress, uh, uh, I don't know, urban, right? But so what? Uh, but he certainly didn't fit a description, a racially profiled description, that, which is what they, they grabbed him for. And in the, uh, the ensuing uh, melee, whatever happened, I mean, anybody here who's ever had to deal with cops in a professional manner, being pulled over, being harassed, you know that they don't just come up to you and ask you like they do on, you know, Andy Griffith's show. Excuse me, can you come with me? Pardon me. Uh, can, we, can I look in your pocket? You know, uh, can I search your vehicle? So if they're looking for an armed robbery suspect, you know that the tension's ratcheted up. And if you're living in a racist community like you're living in Downey, if you're looking for an African-American robbery suspect, look out. Just better look out. So when they accosted Mike, whatever happened, they didn't do their job. They didn't detain him the way they should have detained him. And in the, in the ensuing scuffle, Mikey was shot. Mikey ran for his life. When they finally caught up with Mike, they shot him again. He got shot four times in the back. He was an unarmed man, an uh, innocent man going out to celebrate his birthday. He was a working man. He was a union carpenter. Um, and then the worst part is that, you know, he died in front of his wife, and they wouldn't even let her say goodbye. So what we're talking about here is we're talking about a culture of complete disrespect and disregard for working man's rights. I mean, I, let alone your right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but then we're talking about your basic dignity. I mean, these are your dying breaths, and these guys are so pumped up because they feel like they have the right guy. They feel like they caught their guy. 
So they're going to let him die in the street without even saying goodbye to his wife. That would be bad enough. That would be disgusting enough. But the fact of the matter is that Mikey could have lived if they had administered first aid after they shot him, but they didn't because they knew they had the right guy. And if there was some kind of a physical altercation before this, if there was some kind of a tussle, because like I said, you know how cops come up to you and they put their hands on you if they think that they've got the right man, and if they think that you're a suspect in a robbery, they're going to get away with it because they're fascists and they like to get brutal with people, especially people that they know they can't defend themselves or speak for themselves. So when he stood up for his rights, he stood up for his dignity, he offended them to the point to where his life was forfeit. So now he's laying in the street, he's bleeding to death. He sits up to catch his breath because his lungs are filling with blood. And a cop steps on his chest and puts him back down on the ground, and that was it. Mikey could have lived. Through all, this, through all of this, Mikey could have lived. Maybe he had a different life than, 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 than the life that he had before he went out that night, but he could have lived. But they don't care. They don't care. And, and, and this incident alone, isolated by itself, would be disgusting, would be reprehensible, would be sickening on its own. If it wasn't connected to murder after murder, 10 days before Mikey was murdered in the city, and I'm talking city of Downey here, 10 days before Mikey was murdered in the city of Downey, a homeless man was murdered two miles, two miles from where, where Mikey was murdered. And that guy would have never had any justice, would have had Rosario Vargas, would have never had any recognition if it wasn't for Mikey's murder because he was homeless. And he also happened to be Latin American. He was a Mexican. And, and, and he was, and I, I'm a Mexican. He was the worst kind of Mexican you could be in the city of Downey, a Mexican with no rights, an undocumented Mexican-American. So they thought that one was just going to go away. And that would be bad enough if there was two murders. That would be terrible. Okay, but a year before Mikey was murdered, across the street, and again, if you come out here tomorrow and you come with us to the, to the memorial, you'll see what I'm talking about. Directly across the street from where my best friend, where our best friend was murdered, they murdered an Iraq War veteran named Steve Bors. And, and his biggest crime was three weeks before he was murdered, he got into a fight with the police officers. They beat the shit out of him. They tased him three times. He woke up in a police in a hospital with no idea that he had an altercation with the police. No idea that he had been tased, right? No idea. So he gets out of he gets out of jail. They cite him. Three weeks later, he's out jogging. And now he's carrying he's carrying a, a, a small woodworking tool. <clears throat> and anybody who's been harassed by the cops, who's been threatened by the cops, who has had a cop tell him we're not going to forget this. You're not going to leave your house without some kind of self-defense. Not to mention, you know, I, I see all the time, I see people going out jogging and they've got sticks in their hands because there's wild dogs in the street. They want to protect themselves. You know, there's nothing wrong with having something for self-defense on your person. And it certainly doesn't justify being shot ten times. Once with a hollow point round. There's a federal case going on right now for Steve Bores. He left two children behind. That would be bad enough if that was three murders. The day before... And we just found this out two weeks ago. The day before Stephen Bores was murdered, Albert Valencia of Southgate was tased to death. Tased to death by the Downey police. We asked for, for, for weeks, why didn't you tase Mike? Why didn't you tase Mike? Why don't you at least pull Well, you know why? Because they can't even use their tasers without wanting to kill somebody. This guy was having a schizophrenic episode, freaked out. They chased him down, and they killed him in his own neighborhood. So what we have in the community of Downey is we've got an insulated community that does business on its own. They don't expect anyone to take notice because, you know what, it took us an hour to get here. We live way on the other side of town. We're East Siders. You know what I mean? We live over there. So no one's expecting anyone to pay attention to Downey, especially when they put up this facade. You go to city council meetings, and they blow smoke up your ass. I mean, you think you're in Mayberry. You think you're on TV. You know, they, they pat themselves on the back for their, their veterans memorials, but yet they won't acknowledge that they murdered a veteran a year ago. Instead of giving him the help that he needed coming back with PTSD, you know, uh, they live in an illusion, right? They live in an illusion to protect what I consider to be, you know, uh, Downey has always been a upper class white neighborhood. And that is shrinking, shrinking. And they're desperate to hold on to that. And what you're happening, what's happening now, you know, Mexicans, Latin Americans, we've become the majority in Downey. And we still can't get represented. We still can't even go buy cigarettes in our neighborhood without worrying about getting shot or crossing the street against the red light. Because that's what Mikey's crime was. You know? And I was talking to Doug at one of the rallies that we went to, you know, and I'd just like to share a personal story. When I was 
seven years old. My uncle, my dad's best friend, my uncle, right, was murdered by the Southgate police. Uh, he had gone out, you know, there was a bar in our neighborhood in Hollydale, and he was out at the bar, and he had met this woman, and they had started carrying on a little affair. My mom and dad would tell me, you know, they can remember them talking on the phone, flirting with each other, and this was like his, his girlfriend, you know. Well, it turns out she was a cop's wife. So when it all comes out that my uncle is, you know, sleeping with a cop's wife, <coughs> how do you think that went down? They arrested my uncle for rape. They charged him. And I, you know, we talked to the lawyer. The, they went down, they investigated. They had no evidence. They had nothing on him. Right? This was just an opportunity to get him in a cell. So I remember, I remember being seven years old, talking to my uncle Victor, Victor Ortega, and him telling me, don't worry, mijo, I'm coming home tomorrow. They don't want nothing on me. You know I would never do something like this. And I know he would never do something like this. I'm a seven-year-old kid. My, this is my uncle. This, I, this is ridiculous. That night he hung himself in his cell. I come home from school the next day, and my mom's crying. My dad's just torn up. And he told me he got sick and died, right? Because they didn't want to tell me the truth. Because I'm seven years old. No child should have to know the truth like that at seven years old, right? But I could read. So I go look in the paper, and I find out that my uncle hung himself in his cell. Why would he do that if he was innocent? Why would he do that if he was coming home the next day? Why would he do that? So my parents were livid, right? Now, again, we're talking, this is 1983. There's nothing like what we have today. There are no organizations to help my parents. And my parents are working class, I mean, real working class. 17-year-old mother, 21-year-old father, right, working their asses off to feed their kids. They hire a private investigator who happened to work with the Southgate police. He goes and, you know, does a little digging. And he comes back and he tells my mom, look, I went and I looked and I did, you know, I found something. But you got to ask yourself, do you want to raise your kids in Southgate? Do you want to raise your kids in Hollydale? My mom said, yeah. He said, drop it. Do not follow this because you do not want to open this up. Okay? So my uncle died, was murdered, and nobody did shit about it. Because nobody could, because the intimidation factor. Right now, what's going on in Downey? Okay, I go when I was I go to work and I tell my brothers at work what's happening, and everyone's behind me, right? Everyone supports me, but at the same time, they're like, "You're fucking crazy, dog." To go up against the Downey cops, they're gonna get you, dude. The first time I spoke at a city council meeting, a carpenter came up and told me the next day, "Man, we were <laughs> we're surprised you made it to work today, man. We were betting whether or not you were gonna they're gonna smoke you on the way home from the meeting, you know? Because that's everybody knows what we're dealing with in Downey. Everybody knows how they do business, and everybody knows how they get down." Okay, what we have now, what my uncle Victor, what my parents didn't have in 1983, is we do have an organization. We have organizations that will stand up to this. We stand united in solidarity, regardless of what our backgrounds are, or where we come from. We stand together because we know that this oppression is ridiculous. It was—it's ridiculous when you're riding a skateboard and you get pulled over. I mean, now it's an X game sport, but when we were growing up, it wasn't like that. I had my skateboard in so many cop cars. You know what I mean? I, I, I as as a as a 12 year old, and Mikey was right there with me. You know, Mikey was one of the best skaters I ever knew. So you can you know that we've been getting harassed by the cops since we could skate, right? We've known it our whole lives. And the whole reason that Mikey, when he got stopped by that cop that night, was scared shitless is because we know how the cops deal with you when, they, when the cameras aren't on, when no one's watching. They, you know what? We know how they treat us. He knew that his civil rights were being violated as we speak. And he wasn't going to have it. So he stood up for himself because he had been harassed habitually over and over and over again. The last time I spoke with Mike, one of the last times that we spoke, he had just, he had just gotten done getting detained by a sheriff's deputy uh, for having the wrong attitude. She told him straight up, I know you're innocent. I know you're going to be out in six hours. I just don't like the way you're talking to me. So you're coming with me. Dude's 31 years old. He's got four beautiful children. Works his ass off to take care of his family. You tell me, what is his dignity worth? You tell me. Should he go around feeling like he needs to tuck his tail between his legs every time he sees a black and white? That he should be scared? That he should take his dignity and put it in his back pocket? No. He was tired of it. He was tired of having his civil rights violated. He was tired of being harassed by the cops. See, this is something that happens over and over and over again. And what's happening now is that people who are not familiar with this kind of abuse and harassment, it's starting to come to light. We need to reach those people. 
We need to get out there with our effort and our drive and our ambitions, and we need to, we need to take this message to the city of Downey. What I want to tell my sisters and brothers in here, and let me tell you as a side note, this is my dream to be talking to a room full of socialists. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I'm a union man. I've been in three unions, and I believe in every single one of them. Okay? I love it. You guys are my people. Okay? We need you to get out there and get this message out there. We need you to get out in the streets, and we need you out there putting your bodies on the line. Downey is a perfect battleground city for this movement. Okay? Because they need it more than anyone. They portray that bullshit Disney image to the whole world any chance that they get. And what's really going on is the mind of a madman. It's like a serial killer, right? He puts on a perfect face for the, for the community. But in reality, man, there's something sick and twisted going on in that, in that conscience, right? Well, that's what's going on in Downey, okay? Any of us, Doug, you know, you've been to the city council meetings and you know the disregard and the disrespect that we're treated with. They don't even pay attention to us. They want us to go away so they can go back to business as usual. So they can continue to live the illusion, right? Because as long as they're happy, as long as they're living fat off the hog and they don't have to worry about what's happening in South Downey, a mile away, that's all they want. They'll do whatever they got to do to get the truth out of their life. They want to live in an illusion. But that illusion is a lie. That illusion is hurting us. It's hurting the people who have to live in the real world. Because we're the ones that are paying with our lives. Mikey was a father of four. He had four beautiful children. The oldest is his daughter is 14. His youngest has just turned five without her daddy. Mikey, Mikey would have turned 32 on the 25th of October. He was murdered three days before his birthday. Didn't get to see his four-year-old turn five. It's one of the most beautiful birthdays out there is four to five. You know, that's a transition. He didn't get to see it. She didn't get to have her daddy there. These kids are amazing. We're talking about a family man. There has not been a more righteous cause, sisters and brothers, to get behind that I can remember. I can't remember anyone who deserved justice more than Mikey and his family. And I want to see us all come together. I would love to see us all out there on the line because I'll be there. <coughs> you know what? This is, this is something that we'll never forget because this is our blood. This is our boy that went down. But it's also opened our hearts. You know, we were in Long Beach, and what's happening in Long Beach with, with John Cabrera is sick. You know what I mean? This is an epidemic. It's happening to, to us in Downey, and then, like I said, we're, as we're uncovering it, it's just unraveling. We're finding more and more and more murder, right? But Downey is one city, man. I mean, it's happening everywhere. You know, Fullerton is, is, is in a magnifying glass, but even Fullerton, I mean, it's happening everywhere. You know, and if we don't stand up, and we don't start to get the communities that this is happening, that's the thing, is that there is a community in Downey that's behind us. We need to, 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 to bolster that support. And when they see us out there and they see people coming, oh, they're coming to Downey, they're going to get behind us. They're going to get behind us. They're scared to come out of their houses because they're scared of the cops. But they see some fearlessness out there. They see some courage. They see some conviction. They'll get behind us. They've already started to get behind us. So I'm here to, you know what, I'm, I'm here because I want you guys to know my boy like we did. And you never will because he's gone. But he has touched so many of our lives, and, and he, has, he has made an impact on so many people, all right, that I need you guys, I, I need you to feel him, to, 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 to understand that this was an innocent man who was murdered for nothing, except for the fact <coughs> anger management is a serious issue in every police department, right? John Cabrera was shot because he pissed off a cop. And really, if you, go, if you get down to it, most innocent victims of police brutality, that was their biggest crime, pissing off a cop. That's not supposed to happen in a free country. Our Bill of Rights was written to protect us from that kind of shit, right? They want to sit there and they want to throw that back at us, and we're not the patriotic ones, you know? Don't align yourself with those socialists. Oh, shit, look out. Those guys are, oh, you know, bullshit. You and I both know that we understand what our rights are. We understand what our responsibilities are. We believe in the freedoms that are inherent in the Constitution that was written that guaranteed everybody the freedom to walk around and look like however they want to look and not have to worry about being, in the end, murdered. You know what? You shouldn't even be harassed. You shouldn't even be hemmed up. You shouldn't even be stopped. But once you are, you should be treated with some dignity and respect. That has to change, and it's only going to change if we demand that change. If we get out there and we put our bodies on the line and we show them that we're not going anywhere. was the most dangerous <coughs> weapon
in his arsenal. You know? And that's why they killed him. Because he was truth. He represented truth. He was willing to get out there and get beaten up on TV and have all his people get beaten up on TV so that the world could see how wrong the situation was. Why the hell else would somebody volunteer to get their ass beat on TV? Right? Have dogs turn on them. Have hoses turn on them. Once they're in prison, they have all their civil rights violated. Right? People want to see violence. They want to see uh, the, the radicalism. They want to see us... Downey wants us to try to burn the neighborhood down because then they can, then they can get rid of more of us. <coughs> But if we get out there in solidarity and show our strength in numbers and show this community that it's the first community that's going to change because we're going to make them change, we can make that impact. We can start there. And I'm just telling you, sisters and brothers, it's a great place to start. They need it. It's coming whether they like it or not. So get on board and get out there with us because we need you there. We need every single body on the line. I, I, I implore you. If you're not doing anything tomorrow, you can get out there. Like I said, I know it's a trek. Traffic's a lot better during the day than it is at rush hour. So you'll get out there a little faster. Please come out there. Please come out there and just put your bodies out there with us. Because we're not going away. This is a righteous man. This was an innocent man that was murdered for nothing. But it won't be for nothing if we stand up. It won't be for nothing if we fight. And it won't be for nothing if we make things change. That's the legacy that my boy deserves. That's the legacy that his children deserve. They deserve to at least have the comfort of knowing that things changed because someone murdered their father. We can make that happen for those kids. And I just appreciate you guys even listening to me. It's awesome to speak to a crowd that isn't looking at you with just reprehensible rage and anger <laughs> and silent venom, right? Because that's what we're up against every Tuesday. Get out there Tuesday and see for yourself. These assholes need to see that, you know what? They need to see that we're not going anywhere. We're getting stronger and we're not going to be bullied out of our rights. So, again, thank you for listening. And uh, if anybody's got any questions, I'm, I'm here to answer them or, you know, peanut gallery back there too. <laughs>